everyone so uh, it's another black background so oh my goodness this must mean that we are going to talk about learning about learning so today we're going to talk about the zones of proximal development and at the end of this video you will be able to describe the developmental process using Vygotsky's zones of proximal development you'll appreciate the challenges of linear versus delinearized curriculum delivery in standard adult education and debate the role of traditional versus personalized learning and I like to think about this because I personally lean towards the delinearized curriculum delivery and oftentimes I have students come marching into my office and say, why can't all of the classes be like yours? Well, you know what, there are benefits to linear delivery in terms of efficiency and effectiveness and in many cases skills and uh, development of skills is very, very linear in its progression that you can't get to the end without doing the first steps. But I do really re resonate with a delinearized education. So I want to take some time and parse out what on earth is this and how does this fit into different classroom models. So we are going to visit Lev Vygotsky today. Lev Vygotsky was a Soviet um, psychologist and he actually focused most of his work on um, early childhood development, but many of his theories have been widely adopted and are still practiced to this day. And his most famous theory of the zone of proximal development is still commonly used in um, education and uh, pedagogy. To start you off with a quote, learning is more than the acquisition of the ability to think. It is the acquisition of many specialized abilities for thinking about a variety of things. And it's really interesting to think about the process of learning things and how do you assimilate new ideas. I actually wanted to jump out to uh, an experience that was done by a uh, a friend and someone who's really influential in the Niagara region. Her name is Ruth Unruh, and Ruth has done many, many workshops for a wide variety of different community organizations, and she, she actually did a workshop on Zones of Proximal Development. She uh, posed this question to the participants. She said, think about the things that you are really comfortable doing, and think about the things that you're not so comfortable with doing and she gave out a list and she said I bet some people here are really comfortable with math and they love math and they enjoy doing math um, and other people just hate it and they, and, and they get to a point where they just have a mental block and they can't do math anymore. Some people have no problem driving in traffic and they do it every single day and other people they just can't just can't do it. Nothing at all is going to make them do that. Um, camping. Some people just love camping and the thought of going hiking out into the wilderness hundreds of kilometers away from anything is just delightful and for other people it's just a shell shock. Public speaking, another good example. Some people just thrive and love that experience of being in front of a group of people and speaking and for other people it is just something that you, you just can't get past that barrier. Less uh, uh, chemistry or any number of different technical skills. That same mindset of some people just love it and they thrive in that space, and some people just have a big mental block. And there's that. There's got to be somewhere in between. But uh, using one of uh, Ruth's lines, how can you tame your lion? And there are people who are lion tamers, but most people, if they saw a lion, they would be terrified. And that's really the whole premise of zones of proximal development, that there are things that you have a comfort zone for, and there are things that you need facilitation for, and there are things that you just can't do. And so the, the real premise behind it is that there's this uh, almost target-like or onion uh, skin type of... Uh, diagram that's commonly used in zones of proximal development that at the center the learner can do many things unaided and so if we think about math for example many learners can do a lot of different math concepts and then there is this space of 
where people can do things with guidance, and that's where the education role is, is to figure out what can you do with guidance and how do you structure that guidance to move the learner's capability from what they can do unaided to expand that capability. Last but not least, there's that ring outside that of the things that the learner cannot do. And I really think about zones of proximal de uh, development, both on a um, personal development perspective as well as a vocational or technical development perspective. And so we think about traditional education and we often think of it as a linear process that you go to class and you start learning at the beginning and you learn some facts and figures and you carry on. Maybe throughout the semester you learn one semester and that progresses to the next semester and to the next semester and so on. But in reality, education looks a little bit more like this where some topics are going to be straightforward, some topics are going to be harder, some topics you're going to just blast through, sometimes you're going to miss stuff. And that aspect of a linear education process is not necessarily the reality for a lot of people. In that, why do you miss stuff? You have a bad day. Maybe you have multiple complex issues um, that are um, priorities within your life, taking care of kids, maintaining um, a career, um, being able to manage the cultural um, aspects of learning in a different environment. The reality of education is that while many aspects of um, knowledge acquisition are linear, the process of learning is not necessarily a linear process and it's, it's difficult to be able to manage that. The challenge is, going back to this slide here, is that there is an aspect of acquisition that you can't necessarily jump to the end without having started at the beginning and learned the foundational skills. And so this is where the thought process behind delinearizing the, the experience is important. The challenge is not everyone's own proximal development is in the same place. Some people come to adult education with lots and lots of prior experience, whether that's through prior education or workplace experience. Some people are coming fresh out of high school and don't necessarily have the same complexity, or perhaps they're coming straight out of high school, but their high school may have given them really robust training in chemistry or mathematics or languages that give them an advantage and puts their um, space of proximal development somewhere else on that continuum. Likewise, thinking about the, uh, the aspect of post-secondary education as not just a transaction of knowledge for the purposes of vocation and technical specialty, but also to gain employability and life skills. Some people have zones of proximal development where they need to figure out, how do I wake up in the morning and get to myself to class? How do I make sure I've paid my tuition so that I can actually access the courses that I want to do? And in some cases, those life skills take precedent over the vocational or specialist skills that are um, the normative aspect of post-secondary education. This is that humanizing aspect of the learning process. And so some people, they've got those life skills down and good job. Um, and they're able to put their attention on the vocational skills and specialist skills. Whereas if you haven't got those life skills down, it could be really, really challenging to jump into those vocational and specialist skills. In some cases, there's a real imbalance between what people can do and their ability to take, take teaching and learning. And I've found that in certain cases, you have to humanize the, the process to be able to gain the, the trust and respect to be able to be in that, that intermediate zone here of what the, the, the student can do with facilitation. That aspect of trust, that if that trust is undermined, the zone of what a student can do and the, the zone of what the student can't do, the, the, that space in between where the student, what that student can do with facilitation from the classroom and facilitation from the teacher, that diminishes if somehow that trust is broken. 
And that trust is really important to have that scaffolding is, is the proper term, that scaffolding of between what the learner can do unaided and what the learner cannot do at all. And so we have to be really cognizant of that. In many cases, we do have a really strong ability of trust and that allows for that student to quickly grow their, uh, grow their development and transition it to a much higher skill level and a much higher skill taxonomy. So again, thinking about that linear skill process, I, I know that this is my lived experience, that um, my own personal um, journey to becoming the professional that I am looked more like this than it did this. And so this is one reason that I really resonate with delinearizing the learning process and humanizing the learning process so that we can personalize it and personalize those zones of proximal development. But I totally understand why teachers need to focus on this from an efficiency perspective. They may have an agenda that needs to be accomplished to be able to get to the learning outcomes at the end of a course. And to take too much time to um, personalize takes away from the pacing that's necessary to be able to accomplish that. And that's why I always think of teaching not just as single classes all lined up, but as a communal response that when a student falls off the bandwagon, perhaps in another course, that it's my responsibility in my, um, in my role as an academic program coordinator is to pick those students up who have perhaps fallen off of this linear course and help get them back on through respecting that delinearized process. And so when students walk into my office and say, well, why can't everyone else's course be like yours? And, be more flexible on deadlines and everything and like be, because there's an important role to play with a linear process and every teacher has to find the system that works for them and honestly in this system it takes a lot of effort it takes a lot of drive to make it work and it takes a lot of extra time that I make a commitment to provide but not everyone is uh, within the teaching environment is capable of taking that time out of their personal space and out of their personal boundaries to do that. So where's your zone of proximal development and where does it need to be for you to succeed? So in summary, the zone of proximal development is uh, adjusting it to each learner is the perfect ideal, but only so much personalization is possible. And curriculum delivery within the traditional classroom really needs to be focused on that linearization. If we have too large a class size, personalization is impossible. We just don't have the time and the bandwidth within the day to be able to do it. And so that, that challenge is that the cost of delivery of small classes has a real impact on the uh, financial stability of post-secondary education. Personalization is possible when we're using online self-directed learning. And so that's one reason I love uh, doing all these YouTube videos is that I can delinearize the process and I can pop a YouTube video into a class and say, this is your reinforcement. If you've, or if you've missed that class or you've, for some reason someone can't be participating the way they, they really want to on the day of, they can find that space. The challenge with that self-directed learning is it lacks mentorship and facilitation. And so when we're in these conversations about let's transition everything to online self-directed learning, nope, you need to still have mentorship and facilitation. In a different video, we talked about we talked about Bloom's taxonomy and we talked about Bloom's three sigma problem and that, um, or pardon me, I'm thinking of a different uh, course. Uh, we have three sigma and Schuhart charts. Bloom's two sigma problem. Bloom's two sigma problem says that if you have mentorship and facilitation, self-directed learning is extremely valuable, but that mentorship allows for two sigma higher achievement than just, than just um, learner-centered uh, classrooms. So, leave you with a quote from Lev Vygotsky, the teacher must adopt the role of facilitator and not content provider. And that's a really fascinating quote from um, this. Uh, Lev Vygotsky did most of his research in the 1930s in Soviet Russia. And there has been aspects of um, attribution saying that people are imposing a futurist view on Vygotsky's work, but I'm gonna leave it in your own mind. I think, this this quote from him that was written more than 90 years ago 
honestly really speaks to the current reality of education that teaching is not just about providing content. Content's everywhere in today's world. But how can we as teachers and uh, participants within the post-secondary education environment make sure that we are facilitating the learner's ability to learn for themselves? So I'll leave you at that. And I hope you have some good questions for me because I always love hearing from you. And we will take good care. We will all be safe and I will talk to you again soon.